The hour for convening having arrived, all members will please take their seats. The clerk will please ring the bell. We're going to have the morning roll call. All members present will please vote green to signify their presence in the chamber, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines. Doorkeepers will please close the doors and keep them closed. We will begin our day with scripture reading and prayer by the chaplain, after which we will pledge allegiance to the flag of our country. Our chaplain this morning will be introduced by the lady from the 70th House District, Chairman Lynn Smith. Good morning, Madam Speaker Pro Tem, members of the House, guests in the gallery. It's my honor today to introduce you to Reverend Matt Sapp. He is our minister of the Central Baptist Church, and his wife Julie is over here to my right, your left. And, um, we have some guests in the gallery, and then also, I think it's important to point out to you that um, our minority leader, Bob Trammell, also attends the same church as his family does, as, as does my family. Matt and Julie are new to our Nuna community. They had a new little baby, ten, eight months old, so um, they're, they're bringing some freshness to a very traditional town. I live in Noonan, Georgia, that is a city with a wonderful court square and a downtown anchored by four large century churches with strong spiritual ties and outreach. One example of their outreach is an organization called One Roof, where these churches have a, 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 an organization that tends to the needs of, of the people in our area. There are also several shared ecumenical services. Several of our churches join together as they are right now for some Lenten services. So as you can imagine, when Central Baptist's long-serving beloved pastor retired, the church's search committee spent a very long time searching for its new spiritual leader, Reverend Matt Sapp. Reverend Sapp is a graduate of Mercer University as well as the McAfee School of Theology. He is the son of a Baptist minister and has strong ties with three institutions that his church is also closely aligned with, Mercer University, McAfee School of Theology, and the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Matt grew up in both Atlanta and Richmond, Virginia. He is an avid Braves fan, go Braves, enjoys writing, and has a twin brother who lives in Macon. Matt started his career in the ministry at Wyuka Road Baptist Church in Atlanta, where he served as their minister to students and then minister for congregational life. He comes to Central from Heritage Fellowship in Canton, Georgia, where he served as pastor. It's just been right at a year that we have had the pleasure in my community had this wonderful new spiritual leader. So please join me in welcoming Reverend Matt Sapp. Thank you.
Madam Speaker Pro Tem, thank you for the opportunity to join the Georgia House of Representatives this morning. Representative Smith, thank you for the invitation. I'm proud to have Lynn Smith as my representative in Noonan and honored to have her as a member at Central Baptist Church. It's also a privilege to count Minority Leader Bob Trammell as a church member at Central Baptist, and we're excited to welcome his new son to our church nursery very soon. In addition to being the pastor at Central Baptist, I'm also proud to be connected to Graham Younger and Faith in Public Life and the work they do on behalf of faithful Christians and ministry partners all over our state. I know the last days of the session can be busy ones. Holy Week is a busy week where I work too. But as you begin one of the last days of this legislative session, I wanted to take just a second to remind you of our Christian obligation to care for one another. Those of us who follow Jesus Christ are commanded very clearly to love one another as Christ has loved us. During Holy Week, this week on the Christian calendar, during Jesus' final days on earth when he knew his time with his disciples was growing short, these were his words. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As a Christian, love is to be my defining characteristic. It's the way that others will know who I am if I love others as Christ loves me. The kind of love that Christ exhibited during his ministry on earth extended to all people, to the wealthy and the poor, to the powerful and the downtrodden, to the sick and to the well, to women and men, to Jews and Gentiles, to Romans and Hebrews, even to government leaders, even to religious leaders. But Jesus, Jesus showed a special concern for those who had no one else to care for them. In one parable, Jesus taught that those who had lost their way or gone off track were of special concern to God. In another parable, Jesus taught that those who found themselves the victims of violence were of special concern to God. Still another parable, he taught that those who begged on the street and were often ignored were of special concern to God. And Jesus, by his actions and his words, taught that those who were sick, the lepers, the blind, the lame, the deaf, were of special concern to God. He taught that those who were in prison were of special concern to God. He taught that the poor and the poor in spirit were of special concern to God. Jesus also taught that we would demonstrate our love for God by demonstrating our love for those about whom God was especially concerned. When Jesus taught that love was to be the defining characteristic of a Christian, that's the kind of love he was talking about. Most people have small opportunities to help those around them through civic engagement, charitable work, participation in their religious organizations and churches. But you have a large opportunity as our elected representatives to affect change on a grand scale all over our state. As Christians and faithful church members, many of you, and as those who represent Christian majorities in your districts, all of you, I challenge you to bring those values to work with you at the legislature. I challenge you in your work as you balance competing priorities and complex constituencies to also consider the greater good and civic value of demonstrating a special concern for those about whom Christ was especially concerned. I want all of you to know that as a citizen of the great state of Georgia, I'm grateful for your commitment to your respective constituents, for the sacrifices you make to family and work and community in order to serve in your roles here and for your considerable efforts on behalf of our state. I invite all of you to join me in prayer. God of all creation, we pause, especially on this day, to remember the life of Governor Zell Miller and to commend him to your care. We acknowledge your presence. We ask for your guidance. We rely on your providence. Bless the work of these men and women, bless their families, and bless our state in Jesus' name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very nice.
like that just up with it. Doorkeepers will uh, please open, unlock the doors. The chair recognizes Chairman Taylor, the chair on the Committee of Information and Audits. Madam Speaker, your Committee on Information and Audits has reviewed the proceedings of the previous legislative day and found them to be correct. Chairman Taylor, the chair of the Committee on Information and Audits, reports that the journal of the previous legislative day has been read and found to be correct. Is there any objection to the confirmation of the journal? The chair hears none and the journal is confirmed. The clerk will read the resolution establishing the order of the business of the day. Mr. Burns, Honor 15, I'll move to follow me establishes the order of business during the first part of the period unanimous consents. Introduction of bills and resolutions. First reading and reference of House bills and resolutions. Second reading of bills and resolutions. Reports of standing committees. Third reading and passage of uncontested local bills and resolutions. First reading and reference of Senate bills and resolutions morning orders. Is there any objection to the adoption of the resolution establishing the order of business for the day? The chair hears none. The resolution is adopted. First reading of bills and resolutions. The clerk will read. House Bill 1076 by Representative Paris of the 142nd, Beverly the 143rd, a bill entitled an act to authorize the governing authority of making Bibb County to levy an excise tax. Intergovernmental coordination. House Resolution 1697 by Representative Park on the 101st, Cannon the 58th, Shannon on the 84th, Wen on the 89th, and Smith on the 41st. The resolution encouraging the celebration of the month of June 2018 is LGBTQ Pride Month across the United States. Economic Development and Tourism. That completes first readers. Second reading of bills and resolutions. The clerk will read. House Bill 1074 by Representative Stevens of the 164th, a bill relating to excise tax on tobacco products. House Bill 1075 by Representative Gertler of the 8th, a bill relating to financial affairs. House Resolution 13, 1613 by Representative Gilligan of the 24th, a resolution urging the federal government to address the issue of data security breaches and enact a uniform national data breach law. House Resolution 1614 by Representative Carter of the 92nd, a resolution recommending that local municipalities continue bail reform efforts by adopting recommendations of the Judicial Council of Georgia's Ad Hoc Committee on Misdemeanor Bail Reform, House Resolution 1648 by Representative Smyrie of the 135th, resolution creating the House Study Committee on African American History and, and Culture, House Resolution 1698 by Representative Meadows of the 5th, resolution urging the House Rural Development Council to investigate ways to streamline and make equitable the use of public rights of way so as to expedite the deployment of emerging communications technologies throughout the entire state while retaining local control and of and fair compensation for such rights of way. House Resolution 1699 by Representative Fleming of the 121st Resolution creating the Joint Study Committee on the Selection of Georgia's Future Voting System for Secure, Accessible, and Fair Elections. Senate Bill 485 by Senator Jordan of the 6th, a bill to amend an act providing a homestead exemption from City of Atlanta Independent School District ad valorem taxes. Senate Bill 486 by, Re by Senator Jordan of the 6th, a bill to provide a homestead exemption from City of Atlanta Independent School District ad valorem taxes through second readers. Reports of standing committees, the clerk will read. Representative James Hankersley, the 160th District Chairman of the Committee on Intergovernmental Coordination Local, submit the following report for Speaker Committee on Intergovernmental Coordination Locals out of consideration. 
The following bills of the Senate is instructed me to report the same back the House filing recommendations. Senate Bill 487 do pass. Senate Bill 489 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Representative Jan Tankersley, the 160th District Chairman. Representative Alan Powell, the 32nd District Chairman of the Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security, submitted the following report. Mr. Speaker, the Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security has had under consideration the following bills and resolutions of the House and Senate. It's instructed me to report the same back to the House the following recommendations. Senate Bill 166, do pass by committee substitute. Respectfully submitted, Representative Alan Powell, the 32nd District Chairman. That completes the reading of the reports of standing committees. Third reading and passage of uncontested local bills. Third reading and passage of uncontested local bills. The Senate Bill 487 by Senator Jones of the 10th to Cobb County. Senate Bill 489 by Senator Tippins of the 37th, Cobb County. House Bill 1036 by Senate substitute by Representative Martin of the 49th, Fulton County. One bill on the local calendar is an agree. Having received the requisite number of signatures required, the House delegation wishes to agree to the Senate substitute to the bill. Third reading and passage of uncontested local bills. If there is no objection, we will vote on the local calendar as a whole with a recorded vote. Hearing none, it is so ordered. The clerk will read the local calendar, which he already did. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered on the local calendar? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the passage of the bills? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall these bills now pass? All those in favor of the passage of the bills on the local calendar will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines.
Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines on the passage of the bills, the local calendar. The ayes were 152, the nays were zero. These bills having received the requisite constitutional majority are therefore passed. The chair is moving on to morning orders. We have quite a few morning orders and a very complicated schedule today. If you have a morning order and you wish to speak on it, please come to the front. The chair will call on members once they are in the front. The chair is going to limit morning orders to one minute each, except for anyone who wishes to give a retirement speech today, and those will be limited to five minutes. But all other morning orders will be limited to one minute. The chair recognizes Representative Rogers for a morning order, and Representative McLean. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I just wanted you all to know that uh, it's, it's always a great time to be here, but what I wanted to say to you all is, is that I invited a, a special friend to be with us this morning. He's on the floor with us. Matt Bryan, the, the kicker of the Falcons, is over to your right. Uh, I want you all to know that, uh, you know, a, a lot of people think he's the MVP uh, of the Falcons, and, uh, and I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to see him. So, But he will be here. To say hello to you if you want to take a picture of me in the room, you're welcome to do that. But I want to say thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do will lead the way off. Thank you, Matt. Chair recognizes uh, Chairman Ballinger for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise to draw your attention today to our Fatality Review Project. It is our domestic violence fatality review project for 2017. The report's theme this year was intimate partner stalking, specifically in the context of relationships that end in homicide. An overwhelming percentage, 58% of cases reviewed by the Domestic Violence Fatality Project involves stalking behavior. So please read this, please, um, and if you have any questions or concerns, please see me at my desk. Thank you so much. The chair asks all members to please take their conversations to the ante room and give your attention to the well. The chair recognizes Representative Bennett for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Chair. This morning I rise to recognize a great Georgian, the Dr. Linda D. Woodruff, who passed this life on last Sunday. is a great Georgian that I'd like to give tribute to today. Dr. Woodruff accepted a position in 1978 as an assistant professor at Physical Therapy Department of Georgia State University where she directed the award-winning programs for minority student recruitment and retention implemented by Dr. Pat Yarbrough. Then Dr. Woodruff served as a full professor at the North Georgia College and State University from 1996 to 2005. And in 1991, Dr. Woodruff was appointed as a full professor with tenure and founding chairperson of the Department of Physical Therapy at the North Georgia College in Dahlonega, Georgia. Dr. Woodruff leaves today to cherish her memory. Hundreds of physical therapists across this country and in Georgia, and if any of you have received physical therapy, undoubtedly you have been touched by the life of Dr. Linda D. Woodruff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair recognizes Minority Leader Trammell for a very important announcement regarding one of our members. Please give him your attention. Um, good morning, colleagues. It is with great sadness that I come to the well um, to report that uh, our colleague Sam Park uh, lost his mother late Sunday night 
early Monday morning. She'd suffered with cancer, and um, he will not be here in the last two days. Um, announcement about arrangements will go out shortly, but if you'd please join me in a moment of silence to remember Sam's mother. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Stovall for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members of the House. On Friday, we celebrated men and women in radio. And today, as we close out Women's Month, I recognize Marsha Washington George, known as Radio Lady. She's an author and a strong promoter and, keep, and a keeper of the black radio history. In 1990, she began interviewing African-American radio icons. Her uncle, Ken Knight, opened the first black-owned radio in, U in the USA, Word, W-E-R-D, on Auburn Avenue in 1949. They both are recognized by Georgia Radio Hall of Fame. And in April, she'll actually be starting a new program called Drop the Mic for our young people. Members, will you please rise? And as an author, she also has the Black Radio Winner Takes All, America's first black DJs. Members, will you please rise to help me to welcome and recognize Marsha Washington George. Chair recognizes Representative Bonner for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this morning on your desk, you've got a copy of a, a wonderful book that's called God Has a Plan for the Underdog. This is an amazing story of how a high school dropout uh, eventually built up a multi-million dollar restaurant empire. This was written by a good friend and client, Mr. Shelley Butch Anthony III. He's up in our gallery today. Butch, would you stand to be recognized? Butch is the owner of the This Is It barbecue and seafood restaurants. He will also be down here uh, available for some pictures. And if you want your book autographed, please let me know. Thank you, Butch, for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair recognizes Representative Schofield for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members of the House, I rise this morning to recognize some special guests from Southeast Atlanta. These are the seniors are sweet. These are the special seniors from George Sterling United Methodist Church with Reverend Eric Powell. They are in the gallery. Would you please rise to recognize these powerful and smart, sweet seniors of the ministry. Thank you. Chair recognizes representatives Kirby and Chandler for a morning order. Thank you and good morning colleagues. We have with us today a group of gifted students and a, an exceptional teacher from Grayson High School. We're here to recognize the 2018 Star Teacher of the Year, Dr. Stacy Kenyon, and also the Star Student of the Year, Saket Shursath. We also have with us our valedictorian from Grayson High School, Shivani Ramdas, and the salutatorian, Melina Malikania. And if you all rise so the House can welcome you to our chamber. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Baysmore for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning, colleagues. This morning I rise to recognize an R&B group that started in Atlanta, lives in Atlanta, and they are celebrating their 25th year anniversary. Please write, and my son-in-law is up there with them, has brought them here for us, Adrian Meeks. Please rise and acknowledge the R&B group Silk.
And just to let you know, the, um, the members that are up there is Timothy, Cameron, Jimmy Gates Jr., Gary Glenn, and Gary Jenkins, and Jonathan Rasbrow. Chair recognizes Representative Wynn for morning order. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Just a few moments ago, we learned of the passing of Repre Representative Sam Park's mother, Grace Park. She passed away at 3 a.m. Monday morning, peacefully and without pain. I supported Representative Park's 2016 campaign and like most grassroots campaign, the campaign office was in the dining room of his mother's house. That's how I came to know Sam's mother and her two small and yappy dogs. And because Representative Park won't be with, here with us today and he'll likely not be here with us on Thursday, I wanna take a moment and honor the life of his mother. Grace Park was a single mother who worked two jobs to raise her three children, two girls and one boy. She played the organ at her church and she tutored kids after school. In 2014, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer, a prognosis that gave her only a year to live. But she made it to three years. And in those three years, she went to the polls and voted for the very first time in her life for her son, Representative Sam Park. She came to visit us here at the General Assembly just last month and I hadn't seen her since my own election. She came over to me and she gave me a hug and she said, now, now you are a powerful woman. And I didn't have the heart to tell her, you know, that's really not how it works around here, ma'am. <laughs> so today I'd like us to join um, in a moment of silence for Representative Park's mother and keep his family in our prayers. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Dreyer for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. Um, today I have a resolution honoring immigrant founded business in Georgia. Um, nearly half of the Fortune 500 companies in the United States were founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants, including Google, AT&T, Comcast, Tesla, Intel, Apple, Ford, and Amazon. Um, here in Georgia, immigrant businesses drive $1.5 billion in revenue annually, and we have several immigrant-owned business owners here today. We have folks from Shahari Jewels in Clarkston, Millennium Freight Solutions in Mableton, Happy Valley Dim Sum in, in Norcross, and Element 5 Solutions in John Creek. They're standing up, and I hope you would uh, join me and recognize them and thank them for what they contribute to our economy. Thank you so much. We're glad you are. You chose to be citizens and productive members of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. Chair recognizes Representative Teasley for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, colleagues. Um, I wanted to uh, appreciate that. I wanted to uh, honor the life and legacy of Linda Brown, who passed away this past Sunday. As a little girl in Kansas. Linda Brown's father, Oliver, tried to enroll her in an all-white school in Topeka. He and several black families were turned away, sparking the Brown versus Board of Education case that challenged segregation in our public schools. Thankfully, on May the 17th, 1954, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that separating black and white children was unconstitutional because it denied black children the 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protection under the law. Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Of course, that overturned the court's decision of Plessy versus Ferguson in the late 19th century. As I was thinking about how to close on this, I, I, couldn't, I kept coming up with different ways to say it, and frankly, I couldn't say it any better than Kansas Governor Jeff Collier, who said, 64 years ago, a young girl from Topeka, Kansas, sparked a case that ended segregation in public schools in America. Linda Brown's life reminds us that by standing up for our principles and serving our communities that we can truly change the world. Linda's legacy is a crucial part of the American story and continues to inspire the millions who have realized the American dream because of her. So if you'll join me in a moment of silence for the Brown family and thankfulness to God for her life and legacy. 
Thank you. Chair recognizes Representatives Collin, Gravely, and Cook for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, I'm joined here by Representative Gravely and Representative Cook for, uh, to ask for a moment of silence for one of our community's uh, most cherished members. Former trooper Charlie Lott passed away on Palm Sunday. He spent 30 years of his life serving our state as a peace officer with the Georgia State Patrol. He was a master mason. He received his 50-year Masonic pin from the uh, Douglasville Masonic Lodge there. He was also the uh, uh, chairman of the Friends of Wicks Tavern, which is a uh, nonprofit that has preserved the oldest historic uh, structure in the West Georgia area. He uh, served also as the uh, 2008 SCV commander for the Georgia Division. He was a well-respected member of our community. He was a close family friend, and we're gonna miss him out in West Georgia, and especially in our house district. If you would, bow your heads for this for a moment of silence. Thank you. Chair recognizes Minority Whip Hughley for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Williams is my spokesperson for the morning. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Madam Whip. Thank you, Representative Digley, for your expressions about Linda Brown. And because of your expressions, we're gonna ask that you not stand. You have already shown respect, but I wanted to send it from just a little different perspective. As a young boy, I remember my mother waking me up and telling me about Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, that changed education in the South forever. 17 years later, there began to be some action towards this monumental legislation. But all I remember is that for 12 years, I never got to attend school with any of my white brethren. But I do remember that on the county line in Liberty County, there was a billboard that was put up by the United Clans of America saying impeach Earl Warren. I thank God for Earl Warren. I thank God for this great Supreme Court, but most of all, I thank God for Linda Brown, whose father brought her forth and sued the government. Many, many historical people came out of that suit. Probably the best known of all, Thorogood Marshall was the lead attorney but Charles Hamilton taught him at Howard University. Linda Brown's legacy is not nearly observed enough because Linda Brown did not just free the educational spirits of black people, it's, it freed the educational spirit of Americans. Thank you, Representative Teasley. Thank those of you for showing honor to this young lady who is far too often not recognized. We pray for her family. Thank God for the legacy she leaves. To that, Madam Speaker, I yield the will. Chair recognizes Representative Cannon for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. I rise today to thank the neighbors of District 58 for joining us here at the Capitol today. If those neighbors will stand. Additionally, General Larry Platt who is one of the last people to share his story of being hanged by the KKK as he was a bodyguard for Dr. King who has been commended by this body just a few years ago. And additionally, former state representative Henrietta Turnquest will be here later today to join us as she receives a resolution in her name for 50 years of service to Spelman College. If you will just applaud the members in the gallery who have joined us here today. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Taylor for a morning order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Good morning, colleagues. Today I bring to you a celebration. We're commending the Thomasville High School Bulldog boys basketball team for winning the 2018 GHSA Class II State Basketball Champions. They are a school that has pushed not just sports, but traditions and excellence in education, and we are very proud of these young men that went to battle and came back with a great win. The final score was 66 to 31, and we're very proud of them. Thank you. The chair asks that all members please take their seats and give their attention to the next speaker. This body has a long tradition of honoring uh, our colleagues that are leaving us and listening to them as they say their farewell. The chair recognizes Representative Raffensperger. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning. It's been an incredible honor to be here the last four years incredible honor to serve with all of you. To the people of Johns Creek, it's been an incredible honor. It's been humbling to be your representative for the last four years and to be your city council member uh, seven years ago when you elected me to that office. I'm going to miss all of you. I'm going to miss this building. We've done some great work. What's very special about this building, I think, are several things. One is uh, I noticed that we sit uh, in our interspersed Democrats and Republicans. And so we talk to each other as we are looking at bills and coming from different perspectives. And we sometimes grind on that and work together, but we come together at the end of the day to do what is best for the people of Georgia, and that's very important. I also think that because we open every morning with the word of prayer from our pastor, and I also think the legacy of Martin Luther King that just still hovers over this, this Capitol building that we have a covering that tempers us so we always are focusing on what is best for the people of Georgia. And so Georgia has always moved forward in a positive, constructive way, and that's very good. I won't be here next year, and I'll miss you. I'll miss this grand building, and I'll keep my comments short because I know we have much to do. Madam Speaker, I yield the well. Chair asks for all members' attention to the member that will be in the well. Again, we're going to honor another member that has served in this chamber since 2011. Chair recognizes Representative Brockway. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, it, it has been a great honor for me to serve in this house for, for eight years. And there's a, a whole lot of folks I need to thank First of all, I want to thank my wife uh, for, I, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have her, her blessing and her agreement to serve down here, and, and my, my kids, Hope and Grace and Joy, who uh, were, were young when I started here, and now they're growing up so fast, and it's a real uh, amazing thing to see, to look back at some of the old photos from when we first got elected and see how they are now. It's been amazing, and made so many great friends here. I remember one of the first things the speaker told me when I, when I ran was that we make a lot of friends, that I made a lot of lifelong friends here. There's so many folks to mention. I'll start off with two. Uh, the three of us kind of became good buddies, and uh, you're, you're close. You're close on the list, sir. Uh, uh, the three of us kind of became inseparable, and that's my friend Sam Teasley, who's still here, and uh, my friend Mike Dudgeon, who, who retired two years ago. I've also got to mention our, our crazy crew in, in uh, Suite 504, uh, when I start reading the names off here, you guys will be shocked that, that this collection of people were allowed to be in the same office. Uh, we started off with Representative Allison, Michael Harden, Buddy Harden. Poor Buddy was, was stuck in there with us with his crazy crew. Kevin Cook was in there. Uh, we had uh, John Peasold. Um, who else we have? Delvis Dutton. Rick Jaspers was there. He was smart enough to get out of there as soon as he possibly could and become a chairman. Uh, 
And now we've got Representative Dubnik, Representative Gertler, Representative Perkle, and I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting a few. But anyway, these these guys all became these great friends. We, for years, we had rather uh, spirited debates in Suite 504, but it was a lot of fun. You know, um, so many other folks that I could mention. It's it's uh, the folks that the men and women who come to the legislative prayer breakfast have been uh, have, have been it's been great to take a few moments there and and pray together and pray uh, with each other and for each other. And then all of all of you on, on both sides of the aisle, all the committees I've served on, I've made some great friendships and had some wonderful discussions. So, you know, you all know why I'm leaving. I'm leaving to, to seek another office. I know my friend Brad is too. And I look forward to getting out there on the campaign trail full time starting next week. But uh, if I could say just something political uh, here these last few moments, uh, you know, we're, we're in kind of troubling political times. And there's a lot of division in our country. And I, I read a great book last year by a man named Yuval Levin who talked about, he's called Our Fractured Republic. And he talks about really some things I, that I hope that we all consider, and that's we used to have this broad national unity in this country. But he points out, honestly, that was, that was kind of a rare thing in our political history, this during World War II and that post-war period where America was so united, that was kind of rare. We've always in this country uh, respected regional differences and respected differences of opinion, and uh, each, each part of our country had something different and unique about it. And I think that that's, that's where we're headed now in this country. And so what I would, what I would suggest really is a, a couple of things. We need to, it's so easy these days to retreat into a bubble where we only ever hear uh, opinions that reaffirm our own. And you, it's getting to the point now where you can listen to music, you can eat food, <laughs> all sorts of things that you can do that just reaffirm what you believe. And I would urge all of us, uh, I'm challenging myself too, to break out of that bubble uh, listen to other people who have different political uh, views than you do and respect those differences and respect those opinions. I think if we can do that, if we can understand, we do this every day in the House, quite frankly, we understand that every part of our state is different and that's, uh, uh, that e each district is, is unique and has unique things about it and unique qualities that need to be respected. So if I could leave anything, I would urge you to uh, stick with that. And again, thank you all very much. Thank you for the opportunity to serve in this house. Uh, the people of District 102 have given me a great honor. And God bless you, and we'll see you soon. I'll see you at the Amazon special session later this year. Thank you. Moving on to the rules calendar. The clerk will read the caption to HR 1397, HR 1397. House Resolution 1397 by Representative Dickey, the 140th and others encouraging the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to withdraw the electronic logging device regulations on the agriculture industry and supporting agribusiness. This resolution I'm referred to the committee On Agriculture and Consumer Affairs, that committee recommends that this resolution be adopted by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Chairman Dickey to present the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem, uh, and members of the House. Uh, come to well today to ask you for your support for this House Resolution 1397, which encourages the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to provide alternative electronic logging device regulations for the agricultural trucking industry and supporting agribusiness industries. While driver and road safety is vitally important to the ag industry, these impending federal mandates will negatively impact the livelihood of farmers, producers, ranchers, and consumers. These new regulations are driving up unnecessary costs and immobilizing the ability of farmers, ranchers, and producers to de deliver their products. Rural Georgia does grow the healthiest safety, 
safest and freshest food in the world, but what good is it if we can't get it delivered in a timely manner? A one-size-fits-all regulation is flawed and will impact, out, impact all Georgians. We must recognize that the regulations affecting the agriculture industry must be looked at differently and with more flexibility without compromising safety. We, are, we have the most uh, efficient logistical system in the world to deliver this, this fresh produce, livestock, turf grass, and bees in the world. You know, sometimes um, in this house, I realize we question the need and value of urging resolutions like this to our Congress, but I want to tell you about this resolution and others like it. It has already made an impact. Our own U.S. Ag Secretary, Sonny Purdue, with the urging of farmers, uh, agribusiness organizations, and, and our own uh, Georgia uh, Commissioner Gary Black has seen Elaine Chow, the Transportation Sec Secretary, already place a 90-day moratorium on these new regulations for ag. So uh, these regulations have, uh, have been uh, looked at or being looked at, and I'd ask your favorable consideration on this resolution. The gentleman has a question. The chair recognizes Chairman Watson to your right for a question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does the gentleman yield? I do. Is it not true that this, uh, these regulations and mandates by the federal government have uh, been brought forward in an effort to increase safety on our roads, but have yet uh, increased the demand for trucks, which have put more trucks on the roads? And a lot of times, if you travel the roads, you see them parked on the exit ramps and on ramps, and have in fact. Uh, brought forward some other safety issues that, that need to be addressed and have not only uh, affected our uh, industry as a whole, but will affect the uh, consumers of Georgia that eat fresh fruits and vegetables. Thank you for the uh, question, and you're absolutely right. As a producer, you and I both know the, the challenges we're facing right now with the trucking industry. Thank you so for doing this. For, uh, with that, I'll yield the well, Madam. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Uh, it's working now. Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the adoption of the resolution, the yeas were 162, the nays were 2. The resolution, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore adopted. Clerk will read the caption to H.R. 1160. H.R. 1160. H.R. 1160 by Representative Hill of the Third, creating a House Study Committee on Risks Associated with Kraton. This resolution having been referred to the Committee on Special Rules, that committee recommends that this resolution be adopted. The Chair recognizes Representative Hill of the 3rd District to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is uh, creating the Joint Study Committee on Risk Associated with Kratom and for other purposes. What we want to determine here, because it's such a new thing on the market to a lot of people, is how it's sold, where it's sold, and give the public a chance to comment on the availability of it and the harmfulness of it or the helpfulness of it. And that's what we that hopefully will 
do with this study committee, and I'd appreciate your favorable consideration. There are no questions. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. For what purpose does Representative Jones rise? Chair recognizes Representative Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, isn't that true that I do support H.R. 1160? If the gentleman so states. It is not further true that I happen to be uh, a consumer of Kratom, and I happen to know, mm -hmm. as many others, that Kratom, being a tea, being an herbal, is not a synthetic drug, and that people across this country, both professional people, older people, younger people, we all use Kratom as a source of a healthy dietary supplement? If the gentleman so states. And finally, Madam Chair, isn't that true that I support what Representative Hill is doing so we can clarify a lot of the misunderstanding, the misinformation, the erroneous information as it relates to Kratom, and not a single person uh, where there's any scientific evidence anywhere that a single person has died from the use of Kratom? If the gentleman so states. Thank you, ma'am. We're now ready to vote. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? For what purpose does Representative Cannon rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true that this resolution has no input from the medical community, just members of the House? If the, la if the lady so states. Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the adoption of the resolution. The yeas were 149, the nays were 11. The resolution having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore adopted. Clerk will read the caption to Senate Bill 339. Senate Bill 339. Senate Bill 339 by Senator Ligon of the 3rd, Schaefer the 48th, McCoon of the 29th, Tippins the 37th, Miller of the 49th, and others being titled an act to amend Article 2, Chapter 3, Title 20, the Fiscal Code of Georgia Annotator, relating the Board of Regents and University System, so as to provide for the establishment of free speech policies institutions of the university system. This bill having referred to the Committee on Judiciary, that committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Chairman Earhart to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, House Bu Senate Bill 339 by Senator Ligon is a bill with respect to free speech on our universities and college campuses. The content neutral free speech, free speech that is not retaliated against, free speech, free access, equal protection, that pesky equal protection clause of our Constitution. The gentleman will suspend. Will all members please give the gentleman in the well your attention. Take all conversations to the end room. The gentleman will continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senate Bill 339 is a work product. As it came over here from the Senate, 
the House Judiciary Committee and Chairman Willard did a significant amount of work in concert with the Board of Regents. This Board of Regents has worked very hard over the last three years on the, the free speech policy. They've spent innumerable hours making sure that the students on our campuses are not restricted in their speech. Of course, on every campus in every venue, there are time, place, and manner restrictions. You can't take a bullhorn to class and interrupt or disrupt everybody else's class experience. You can't take a bullhorn onto the commons and interrupt somebody's experience. But we consistently have on our campuses those who are not liberal or conservative, they're activists who have a problem with others' free speech. They have a problem with the free exchange of ideas and free thought, which is the basic premise of a university, is to hear all of those. I don't know about most of you, but I, you had choices when you were on those campuses. You could walk by somebody that you disagreed with. You could stop and engage. But most of us didn't get in their face, tear down their signs, stand there in a in a forum where an invited speaker was there and scream and holler like petulant children, snowflakes, Tide Pod eaters. <laughs> What's happening to our millennials? Fortunately, most students are not in that. But we had a hearing yesterday on some issues that the institution in my district, Kennesaw State University. And again, kudos to the university system and the regents for telling them, you will clean your house. They found, ladies and gentlemen, they found that free speech on that campus had been restricted over and over and over again. It was in the report that they gave. The campus's own report said administrators were utilizing viewpoint as a reason not to allow individual organizations access to space, access to campus resources, access to security, all of those things. That's repugnant. It's objectionable. There ought to be one type of student organization and one type of invited speaker. Equal access. Content neutral. This piece of legislation guarantees that. The regents have a great policy. These are just some tools for them to use to make sure that on our campuses, liberal viewpoints, conservative viewpoints, viewpoints of anyone are respected, supported, and given a free reign. That's what this does. Madam Speaker, I'll be glad to yield for questions. If not, I'll yield the well and ask for your favorable consideration. The gentleman has questions. The chair recognizes Representative Fleming for a question. I yield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Mr. Chairman, is it not true that I know that you and others worked with the Board of Regents to make some changes to the bill as it came over from the Senate that I believe still accomplishes all the goals uh, that you mentioned, but also makes it, for lack of better terms, more palatable, something that our university system can work with all the while trying to make this effort to sustain free speech on campus. Is that not true? That's very true. Thank you. Chair recognizes Minority Whip Hughley for a question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does the gentleman yield? I yield. Can you uh, speak about the sanctions that you all envision for students uh, that, that you're talking about here, that students that violate this provision that you're putting in, what kind of sanctions do you anticipate they will suffer? No more than the current sanctions for violation of the student codes on campus. If you'll read through the, this bill, there are no separate or new sanctions in place. If you violate the student code, there are a set of, on every single campus, they have a set of sanctions or consequences for actions. In other words, if you stand and um, rush a podium of an invited speaker with a sign and foul language and that kind of thing, I think most reasonable people would say that's a violation of someone's rights and that should have a consequence. And the student codes at every one of our institutions and the regents have a current policy that would provide certain consequences for that. 
And I, I think most pe reasonable people would agree that that's something that ought to happen. Uh, chair recognizes Representative Shannon for a question. Does the gentleman yield? I yield. Isn't it true that this bill would likely be found unconstitutional in court because if you sanction the right for somebody to shout down a speaker, you then are infringing on their First Amendment rights? Your First Amendment rights to shout me down end, let me emphasize that, end when you infringe upon my rights. That is a basic premise of constitutional law in this country, and I'll take that to any court that you want to choose the venue for, and we'll see who wins. That is incorrect. <laughs> Says the constitutional scholar. The, the chair recognizes Representative Morris to your right for a question. I yield. Does the gentleman yield? I yield. Uh, yesterday in your committee meetings on higher education, we had two young women that came from a local university and testified how they had been discriminated against at a university in this area, how they had been told to leave class because of their position. And as they were leaving, water bottles were thrown at them. Will this bill help protect those young women, those young women that are barely older than my high school senior right now? Yes, sir, this bill will protect those young women and any other individual on a college campus who is subjected to that treatment. And unfortunately, this is not a issue that can be taken care of just with an overarching policy, and the regents are trying, but this is campus to campus. These are these activist administrators and instructors who have such a fascist outlook on the speech of those who they disagree with that they will allow that type of retaliation on viewpoint, and that's what this bill is designed to protect. Thank you for helping protect those young women. Madam Speaker, I'm going to yield the well and ask for your favorable consideration. The gentleman has yielded the well. The chair recognizes Minority Leader Trammell to speak on the measure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, this is a bill in search of a problem. This isn't a Georgia problem. This isn't something that we need here. Our university system schools are perfectly capable of dealing with this issue. You know, there's a cottage industry that is set up and designed to take speakers who peddle outrage. Their whole purpose is to go and shock as much as they can. Uh, and then they even have, in some cases, they have people lying in wait with video cameras to wait for the response to make somebody so angry that when they're provoked, they go, and if they're assaulted, then they turn around and they take that and they go to court. You know, all this bill does is handcuff the ability to respond to specific requests. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution needs no additional protection from the Georgia General Assembly. Free speech is free speech. And if it's impeded upon, the courts are there 24-7 for people to go get their redress. What this bill would do is create a lawyer's bonanza, sit down in a deposition and get university administrators out to talk about the Board of Regents policy that's promulgated and go through the steps and talk about why with a specific invitation that was declined, you didn't follow this policy. What a nightmare. What an unnecessary nightmare. Now I wanna talk about another provision in the bill you know, we talk about speech in the context of um, someone standing up, making a speech, but speech takes many, many forms. If you have a sign, that's speech. If you do a protest, that's speech. And this bill seeks to prefer one type of speech over another. And if you doubt it, all you have to do is look to lines 45 through 49 of the bill, which would require the regents to promulgate a policy that says that if you engage in a counter protest against speech with which you disagree, which is perfectly within your First Amendment right under the United States Constitution, that you should be subject to disciplinary sanction by the school. That's an infringement of First Amendment right that we're seeking to enshrine in state law. It's unnecessary. 
it's unnecessary. We have the tools that we need today to deal with this issue. This isn't a Georgia problem. The First Amendment adequately addresses it. I would urge my colleagues not to over-regulate in an area that is very, very clear and that we don't need to interfere with. Madam Speaker, I yield the well. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. The chair recognizes Chairman Willard, the chairman of the committee for the chair's time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let me emphasize again what uh, was stated by Resident Earhart. This is a purpose bill that is considered to be neutral by the Board of Regents. They recognize that the, the, the legislative body is enacting in, in a bill that guarantees the right of free speech to all parties who are on campus, whether they're students or whether they're visitors. We worked with the Board of Regents. They've taken a position there supportive, not supportive, but neutral on the bill itself. And glad that we've taken the time to work with them on it. I'd like to yield the rest of my time, Madam Speaker, to Representative Fleming. Chair recognizes Representative Fleming. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. I do support 100% this bill. This is a free speech bill, and if you support free speech, you'll vote yes on this bill. I was not intending to take the well until I heard the distinguished minority leader's comments. And he said, I believe, this is a problem in search of a solution or something to that effect. That could not be more misleading. I do not think he intended to mislead you, but I don't think he was in the Judiciary Committee when we heard witness after witness after witness, college kids in an atmosphere where free speech should abound and the exchange of ideas should exist without intimidation, tell us stories from things that have happened on the campuses in this state and the failure of college people running the schools to do anything about it. I'm going to share one of those stories with you very briefly. A rabbi came before the House Judiciary Committee and testified about the invitation that they had extended to some students from Israel to come to the campus and speak on issues relating to the Middle East. They could not carry on the proceedings. None of the students there could hear the program because another organization opposed to Israel came into the classroom, the setting, and shouted them down. They had to be drug out by the police. Now, that's not what's bad. Here's what gets worse. I'm going to give that university time to straighten out that problem, but as of the date of our hearing, no action had been taken by the university against those students who came in and shouted down the guests and would not allow them to speak. What this bill does is it begins to put pressure on our universities to act the way they should have been acting all along and that is to protect freedom of speech on campus, to protect the fair exchange of ideas. I would ask you to vote favorably for this bill, and if you do, you are protecting freedom of speech in this state. Thank you, and I yield the well. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection? For what purpose does Representative Cannon rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Uh, is it not true that with this measure, if a student group hosts a group on campus and that outside group infringes upon the free speech rights of a student, then there would be unfair sanctioning of those students? I'm sure the lady knows of which she speaks. All right, the chair is ready to vote. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? Chair hears none, the committee substitute is adopted. Chair will recognize one last member for parliamentary inquiry. The chair recognizes Representative Drenner. For what purpose does Representative Drenner rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State Mr. your inquiry. Is it not true that I am a college professor and that I personally do not agree with a lot of my students' positions on issue? However, Madam Speaker, is it not true that they have the right to say 
what it is that they believe and that I, as a professor, should recognize that right. If the lady so states. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All in favor of the passage of the bill will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of the bill. The yeas were 110, the nays were 57. The bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. The chair recognizes Representative Gilligan to introduce the doctor of the day. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Madam Speaker. I have the privilege of introducing our doctor of the day today, Dr. Patrick Kendrigan. Dr. Kendrigan grew up in Alpharetta, where he attended Milton High School and then the University of Georgia, go dogs. After an eight-year career in finance and IT, Dr. Kendrigan pursued a career in medicine he attended the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine in Swanee, Georgia. And then he completed his family uh, medicine residency at Floyd Medical Center in Rome, Georgia. He now serves the community in Forsyth County and he's been serving there in the family practice of the Morrow Family Medicine since 2016. And then when he does have some spare time, he lives on the lake, Lake Lanier, up in our area, and he spends time with his wife and two daughters. So please make welcome the doctor of the day, Dr. Patrick Kendrigan. Thank you very much. Thank, I really you. Appreciate it. Thank, you. Thank you. I'm uh, honored and privileged to be back here in the state capitol. I had the opportunity when I was growing up to serve as legislative page. It's nice seeing all the pages running around here. As well, of as well as legislative intern back in college. So I know firsthand the sacrifices it takes from the folks in this room and your staff to do the business of the people of Georgia. So I want to remind you to take care of your own health and wellness and make sure when this, se when this session is over to go see your family doctor for a checkup. Thank you very much. Clerk will read the caption to Senate Resolution 146, Senate Resolution 146.
while the clerk's office locates the resolution, the chair will recognize, uh, th the clerk will read the caption to SB 127, one, SB 127. Senate Bill 127 by Senator Kennedy, the 18th, Schaefer, the 48th, Alvarez, the 56th, Black, the 8th, Kirk, the 13th, and others. We entitled an act to amend Code Section 171715, the official code of George Annotator, relating to failure to provide notice, not rendering a responsible person liable or compromising a basis for error. This bill having referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Non-Civil, that committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Chairman Golick to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House. Uh, SB 127 is actually the companion legislative matter to SR 146, and this, this all has to do with enshrining certain protections for victims of crime in our Constitution, and then SB 127 is the uh, companion legislation for that constitutional amendment, which, and we'll act on the uh, constitutional amendment in short order but in uh, SB 127, what this simply provides is for a crime victim to have a mechanism to file a motion in court if, in fact, they've not received the requisite notification uh, of certain proceedings uh, from, the district from the prosecuting attorney and have not been given the ability to be heard on certain matters. Uh, that's simply what the bill does. We have those protections right now, Some, uh, generally those protections in code right now. This particular bill tightens those up, and then the constitutional amendment, which you will vote, hopefully vote on in just a few minutes, will go ahead and take those protections and put them in the Constitution, as I believe 36 other states have done as well. I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. There are no questions. Thank you. I yield the well. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All in favor of the passage of the bill will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no. And the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, The clerk will lock the machine on the passage of the bill. The yeas were 170, the nays were zero. The bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. The clerk will read the caption to Senate Resolution 146, Senate Resolution 146. Senate Resolution 146 by Senator Kennedy, the 18th, Mullins, the 53rd, Ligon, the 3rd, Schaefer, the 48th, Albers, the 56th, and others. Proposing an amendment to the Constitution so as to provide for certain rights for victims who have suffered or been harmed due to an act committed or attempted to be committed in violation of the criminal or juvenile delinquency laws of this state. This resolution having been referred to the Committee on Judiciary Non-Civil. That committee recommends that this resolution be adopted by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Chairman Golick to present the resolution. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, this is the constitutional amendment that I referred to just a few minutes ago. Uh, this is an effort that started last year, and again, this is uh, to confer certain rights upon the victims of crime, specifically in the areas of notice and hearing. And you can see those uh, set out in line 16 through line 25 of the constitutional amendment. Um, and while you're looking at that, this is an effort that began last year uh, and has really gone through several starts and stops over the last several years. What we wanted to do is to make sure uh, 
that we had a proper balance in our system to uh, assure that victims of crime had the opportunity to receive certain notices of certain uh, events going on in the prosecution of an individual and also the opportunity to be heard. We also wanted and needed, frankly, to, to balance those considerations against practical considerations that are going on in court every day to ensure that the wheels of justice keep on turning. Uh, as a result, when this, bill, when this constitutional amendment came from the Senate, we elected to go ahead and uh, uh, call timeout and take a look at it in the interim and to make sure that uh, the various stakeholders uh, in this debate were uh, brought to the table and we could achieve a consensus on, again, what conferred rights under our Constitution uh, for, certain, for crime victims in certain situations having notice and hearing but also making sure that the wheels of justice turned. Uh, if the voters, if the citizens of this state approved this measure uh, this coming November, it would take, a, the constitutional amendment would take effect immediately and then SB 127, which you voted on uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, would take effect soon after as the companion measure. With that, I'll be answer, happy to answer any questions uh, if there are any on SR 146. There are no questions. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll yield the well. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the adoption of the resolution, the yeas were 169, the nays were zero. The resolution having received the requisite constitution majority is therefore adopted. All members, please give your attention to the gentleman that will be in the well as we bid farewell. The chair recognizes Chairman Taylor. Chairman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I ended up here kind of as a draftee. I literally uh, ran with one day's notice um, when my state senator decided not to run the day before qualifying uh, eight years ago. Um, had never set foot in this building before 2006. Um, Dan Weber was a was hello. There we go. I was a, was a, uh, my my senator did a great job chairing the uh, Senate Education Committee, but uh, literally called us at one at, uh, Sunday at four o'clock in the afternoon and said, uh, "Guys, I'm not running again." And that's how I ended up here eight years ago. Uh, never was on my blueprint. Um, I'm proud to have chaired MARTOC now for the past four years. Uh, transit is a key economic development backbone and transportation infrastructure to our state. And um, as we move forward with the Transit Governance and Funding uh, Commission, and hopefully, uh, you know, in the next couple of days, get the, the, these things out here, um, recognize that even if you don't live in the metro area, this is important. Um, I picked up a uh, year before last 8,500, that's 8,500 jobs in my district uh, from State Farm moving there based on th the fact that it was actually uh, co-located with Morna. Um, proud to do work with uh, Chairman Willard, the Governor, DOT on the Georgia 400, 285 interchange uh, upgrade. Uh, this is a $700 million project that we work for years to put in. Um, I don't know how many cars come through your district every day, but this is 420,000 cars a day come through that one intersection in DeKalb County and, and Fulton. Um, I'm equally proud to have represented the state in six separate overseas delegations, two to Turkey, one to Greece, two to Taiwan, uh, and the first legislative de delegation in 40 years to Japan last December. Um, speaker has called me the International Man of Mystery, and I also want to recognize the members of what I call the Kyoto Caucus, uh, who joined me in Japan, Speaker Pro Tem, uh, Chairman David Knight, Deputy Whip Beskin, and Vice Chairman Trey Kelly. As the unofficial outreach to the Counselor Corps, we have 79 foreign consulates in Atlanta. I want to say that if we want to remain in a position we're in to do international business, we need to be sensitive to international issues and how they can impact our state. And I'll cite an example of the city of Brookhaven has, has done a couple of things that um, have, has, have affected uh, our relations with a, with a key trading partner here. 
be careful when you put in resolutions. Um, you know, think, think globally, think how it affects the state, because what we do down here, it may seem innocuous, but it's important. If we want to remain the number one state to do business in, we need to be business friendly. Also proud to be uh, in Hollywood with Governor Deal um, when we announced that Georgia was number one in the world in feature film production. I especially want to thank uh, Chairman Ron Stevens for allowing me to establish the Film and Entertainment Subcommittee of Economic Development. This industry employs thousands of Georgians and had an impact, uh, an economic impact of $9.5 billion in 2017 and is on track to make that almost $12 billion this year. Um, Hollywood is now number four, after Georgia, the UK, and Canada. However, we can lose this. Um, somebody says RIFRA, they get ready to leave. Um, my subcommittee has traveled to all these studios, and basically, even at Pinewood, which they have the first um, feature production with a billion dollar production budget, um, they said, you know, if we pass RIFRA, and uh, you know, this is a, a, it's a serious thing, um, Pinewood will be the most expensive empty warehouse space on earth. Uh, ask North Carolina and Louisiana um, how, that, how that fared for them. They've lost the movie industry and are not coming back. Um, I want to talk about a couple of friends that have departed while, we're, while, while we've served together. My office mate Bobby Franklin passed away a few years ago. Uh, Bobby was uh, controversial, but he was always a true gentleman. Two of my former uh, seatmates, uh, Calvin Hill and Harry Geisinger, obviously, uh, as well as Bob Bryant, who represented the Garden City and the Fort of Savannah. Um, Two of my seatmates that I sat with for a long time, we called ourselves the crew of Apollo 13. Poor Lynn Riley had a sit between Joe Wilkinson and I for four years. And I think that's why she begged uh, the governor to appoint her to the Revenue Commission, <laughs> sitting between two old retired sailors for that long. She got an earful of a whole bunch of things. Um, to my fellow veterans, thank you for serving. We all have one thing in common. At one point, whether you served in, in war or peace or both, um, we all swore an oath and signed a blank check to the United States that, up, that included up to and including our lives. Um, let's remember that, those folks who, who made that sacrifice. I'd like all the veterans to stand. I'd like to thank, um, particularly some people who've supported me a lot down here. Zenaida Vagdalek, who is my admin, uh, formerly uh, had Lee Goff as my admin. Uh, these ladies, uh, Zaneda um, works the office with, with Chairman Tanner and I right now, but she's doing MARTOC, Transportation, Transit, Governance and Funding Commission, and Film, and she's just a joy to be with and uh, a, great, a, a great state employee. Um, also want to thank my members of the, you can see the lapel that I'm wearing, the, the Honey Badger Caucus, and you know who you are here today, and it's significant to that. Um, so after 35 years of my service to my country, community, and state, um, I will probably be yielding to well the last time. I also want to especially um, want to thank my wife for 34 years, Wendy, for all the support. Uh, you can't do this without family. Madam Speaker, I will yield to well. All members, please give your attention to the well as we, uh, as the chair recognizes another valued member, Chairman Buddy Harden. <laughs> Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. You know, I thought, what, what can I say to this group? You're all great folks, and I, I just decided I'll sit down and write a short letter because I know I've only got five minutes, and I just would like to read that letter to you. First, I want to recognize my office manager, my intern, my policy advisor, my campaign manager, my consultant, my public relations specialist, and my news media advisor, who has made it possible for me to be a part of this amazing people's house of the state of Georgia for the last 10 years. Before you start thinking you can't do that in five minutes, that will take forever, let me say that all these duties were held by one beautiful lady who is also the love of my life. She is a lady with whom I will celebrate our 55th wedding anniversary on the, on the 20th of next month. Y'all recognize over here. <laughs> you
You know we're called by many names in this house, some of which I can't mention here. We are referred to as representatives, legislators, politicians, house members. I have not been a prolific legislator, writer of laws, but I have had the opportunity to work on and influence many bills that directly impact my district, my people, and my profession. I'm not a great politician either, and don't enjoy campaigning as much as I should, but I am married to a politician and have been able to gain five terms in the House. I hope that I've been a good House member, but there's but that is for you to decide. The title that I prefer is representative because to me that is the job description. My first duty has always been to represent the people of District 148, which includes Crisp, Houston, Pulaski, and Wilcox counties, and to help them find a way to achieve economic success and improve their communities as well as help solve their problems and issues that are impacted by state government. In closing, let me have three points I'd like to share with my friends in the House. I thank you all for your friendship and for your support on legislation important to my district and my people. I can't mention everyone by name, but let me give a special thanks to Speaker David Rawlson, who has given me the opportunity to serve on committees that were most important to my district. To Speaker Pro Tem Jan Jones, whose counsel and advice from the very first time I was elected has been a major part of what I've been able to accomplish. To Agriculture Committee Chairman Tom McCall, who championed issues that impacted my mainly agricultural district. And a special thanks to Chair of the Natural Resources and Environmental Committee, Madam Chair Lynn Smith, who afforded me the opportunity as chairman of her subcommittees to influence legislation not only important to, but also critical to my district and my state. Number two, I will miss you all, some more than others. <laughs> but be assured that every one of you has added in a positive way to my life and to that of Linda. Number three, I respect you all. Even though we don't always have the same ideas and we may vote differently on certain issues, I am sure that each of you is voicing the wishes of the people whom you represent. And as I stated earlier, representative is the job title and the name of the badge you wear. This farewell letter becomes effective on December 31st, 2018. Thank you very much. Clerk will read the caption to Senate Bill 338. Senate Bill 338. Senate Bill 338 by Senator Ligon of the 3rd, Couser to the 46th, McCoon of the 29th, Miller of the 40th, Gooch of the 51st, and others being titled an act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 13 of Title 50, Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to general provisions for administrative procedure so as to modify requirements for agency rulemaking. This bill has referred to the Committee on Judiciary. That committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. The chair recognizes Chairman Willard to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this is a bill I think everybody can get their arms around and feel good about it. And I'm going to tell you why background, what, what went on. Back last summer, we had some rules adopted out of Department of Revenue that some of the legislative members had issue with. And uh, Chairman Powell's committee called a meeting as a matter of our ability under the law to make a review of those rules. Uh, and some issues came up about how to get members there because we had to be present. You couldn't do it by, by telephone or other means. So come the start of the 2018 session, the Senate, through Senator Liggins and others, began to preparation of a bill to try and clarify that. The bill passed the Senate. It came over to the House. It was assigned to the Judiciary Committee, and we began looking at it. We began looking at the 
the case law that addresses what can and cannot be done by a legislative body to try and stop or cancel rules adopted out of the executive branch. And there is some federal case law dealing with this point. So as we began reading the law, we call it the case law, and looking at what we had as far as provisions in our Georgia law at the current time, we came to the realization that what we currently have, if it was challenged, would most likely not pass the constitutional muster and be accepted as a way of our having the right to review rules adopted by the executive branch and the various departments. So with that background, let me tell you that we began working and putting together a bill that we believe does answer those questions. We as a body have the right to make a review jointly with the Senate of rules and regulations prepared by a department of the executive branch. But we have to do it as a joint body, meaning a resolution has to pass this body and a similar resolution has to pass the Senate as a way of stopping the adoption of a rule. Of course, we are not in session all year. We're in session for three months. So they adopt a rule in July, and we're not here, that rule would come into effect otherwise. What we have set up is a mechanism that rules adopted during the calendar year have to be submitted to legislative council by December the 15th of a year. We will then come into session on some second Monday in January, and at that time, if we have issues about the particular enforcement of a rule or regulation adopted through the executive branch, we can then take action. We can either say we disagree with that rule and the Senate does the same thing, we can stop the rule. Now what we do is we pass a resolution. That resolution by both bodies then has to be approved by the governor, but I think we'd have the governor's attention because if we disagree with the governor, I'm sorry, if the governor disagrees with what we've done, and he says, I'm going to veto that. What do we have the right to do then? We have a right to override the veto. So we have a constitutional mechanism in place. The rules that are adopted during the calendar year would come in December 15th. We would have until March 15th to make a decision on that rule, either going forward or trying to stop it. If no action is taken by March 15th, then the rule does become implemented. We could also adopt a resolution to allow that rule to take immediate effect if we wish to while we're in session. But what about emergency situations? We have the provision. If you look on page, I'm getting over here to the rule part of it. There's a section dealing with emergency on page six. We have a section under A which is called emergency means. And what we do is we're allowing if there is a reason for public health, safety, and welfare, a need for a rule to be adopted during the time that we're out of session, that commissioner or that director, department, and their body would be able to adopt a rule, but it has to be then approved by the governor's signature to become effective. And then when we come into session, in that second Monday in January, we'll have the right to review it again at that point in time, whether we're going to allow that rule to go forward or challenge it. Those are the ways that we can do things. Now, one last point, but we tried to cover everything possible we could think of. If we pass a law during this session, 2018 session, and the department has to implement rules based upon our giving them the authority to do that, we will recognize that as being done as an emergency rule as long as it goes for it and has a governor's signature so that we're saying we, we, we adopt the law this session, we recognize that there has to be implementation of rules for that law that we pass. We're allowing them to do it under the section of what we call emergency rules. So even then, there's an opportunity to get a rule implemented while we're not in session. I know it sounds somewhat technical, but I say it gives to us 
this, this body, this legislative body, the true constitutional oversight of what is being done by the executive branch in the adoption of rules that may affect the citizens of our state. Madam Speaker, with that background, I'll be glad to take questions if there are any. The gentleman has a question. The chair recognizes Representative Hawkins to your right for a question. Mr. Gentleman, will you yield? I do. Uh, looking at this on this line 193, you're talking about public health emergencies. That 30, section 38.3-3, I believe that's the uh, emergency management section in Veterans Affairs? That's, that's correct. Okay, so my question is this. <clears throat> like we had this morning, an announcement of 1,000 exposure cases of hepatitis. Uh, if the Board of Medicine and Board of Dentistry felt like they needed to do something that was unforeseen and, and pass the rule, right now they have 30 days to, to get the rule and passed, would this exception cover them in any way? It, it absolutely would. I think it also has covered them in the first section under emergency which says a condition creating imminent peril to the public health. Right. So either one of those covered. Thank but we want to be sure that we were not right. hamstringing those public health officials looking to care for us to be sure that we're not in danger of epidemics. Does the gentleman further yield? I do. Thank you. I'm going to miss your wisdom. Thank you. Okay. I, I said I'm going to miss your wisdom oh. from this house. Well, thank you. Thank so, you for such a good bill. You're a good man. Chair Been recognizes Chairman England for a question to your right. Yes, sir. Does the gentleman yield? Yes, I do, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I like this bill an awful lot, but I do have one question. Is, is this serving as your retirement address <laughs> during your presentation here? The second act comes tomorrow, Thursday. Oh, th <laughs> thank you for the warning. Thank uh, you. <laughs> there are no more questions. Appreciate your support. Good bill. For what purpose does Representative Williamson rise? Uh, Madam Speaker, I apologize, but I guess at this point it'll be a parliamentary inquiry. State uh, your inquiry. Is it not true that this uh, body has gone to great lengths to protect our state chartered uh, financial institutions to offer parity? Uh, I apologize, uh, Mr. Chairman. I was mashing the wrong button trying to make an inquiry. If the gentleman so states. Uh, so is it not further true that this could uh, delay the implementation of a uh, parity order uh, responding to a federal uh, power coming to our nationally chartered uh, federal banks <coughs> that it could potentially delay the impact of a state chartered, uh, of our State Department of Banking and Finance to grant parity powers to our state chartered institutions up to 470 days. Is that not true? The chairman believes the gentleman knows that of which he speaks. Is there any objection? For what purpose does Chairman Willard rise? Parliament inquiry. State Madam your Speaker. inquiry. Is it true that what is spoken by the gentleman is addressed by the fact of an emergency rule, that it has to be implemented all it be done is have it sent to the governor for his signature under the emergency rule of the general welfare of the state. If the gentleman so states. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. There is a rule substitute. It has been printed and distributed and it is on your desk. It's LC298119S. Is there any objection to withdrawing the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is withdrawn. Is there any objection to adopting the substitute approved by the committee on rules? The chair hears none. The substitute is approved. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All in favor of the passage of the bill will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no. And the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted?
If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of the bill. The yeas were 173. The nays were zero. The bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. Would all members please give their attention to the well as another valued member gives his remarks. The chair recognizes Representative Cassis. Representative Cassis. Oops. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen of the House, uh, it really is, or has been, for the last 16 years, an honor and a privilege to have served with you and to have represented uh, the people of the 107th, who were the 103rd before that, who were the 68th before that, but uh, thankful for their um, trust in uh, allowing me to represent them, these couple of decades. I want to thank some dear friends. I, I wish I could go around and thank everyone, and I'm going to have to do that personally in the next couple of days. But there are some real dear friends that have really impacted my 16 years here in the House. I, and I have to start with a lobbyist, if you can believe that. It's uh, Alan Hayes and his dear wife, Deborah, who I cut my political teeth with them. and. Uh, ran the first campaigns met back in 2000 and have really impacted my life, not just here in the house, but as friends, a uh, very strong friendship. I wanna thank Earl Earhart. He came to my high school class and spoke when I taught at McEachern High School and when I announced that I was running in Gwinnett County, he was one of the first ones that encouraged me and became a mentor uh, to me uh, as I began as a freshman. I want to thank the class of 2003. You know who you are, the few and the proud that are left. Yes. Uh, and just thankful for their support throughout the years. Some dear friends, Tim Barr, Buzz Brockway, Sam Teasley, um, Kevin Cook, Wes Cantrell, and of course Howard Maxwell for the times that we have spent and the friendships that we have forged uh, here on the House. And those that have left, if they're listening, Congressman Tom Graves, Martin Scott, Congressman Barry Loudermilk, Joshua Clark, wherever you're traveling in this country, and Jeff Duncan, wherever you are in the state, uh, good friends, and just so thankful for the time we've spent together here in the House. And to my dear, dear, dear friend, Brooks Coleman, who I have sat beside 14 years. I, I would encourage some of you to try that one, one time. But we have been able to work together and fight together and argue together, but more importantly, be, just become very good friends. And I'm just going to miss you, Brooks, and uh, in our times together here in the house. Uh, to the secretaries of the Suite one, 601, where I have spent 14 years uh, there. First of all, with Pamela Lewis, who has been so good to my children and my family, and to Kathy, thank you for all your help. And now I'm going to thank the doorkeepers. Because you see, when I was running my first time in 2002, a month before the election, we found out that we were having Ellie. And in 2005, during the session, my son Jonathan was born. So they have only known this place. And the doorkeepers have been so wonderful to my children, especially Jonathan, who is a legislator in the making. But especially now to my family, not just Jonathan and Ellie, but to my wife, Anne, who I know has impacted some of your lives too. And I'm just so thankful to her her support through the years, her love, and uh, to the next season together. You know, 
my journey started 16 years ago, but it started way before that, when my parents left Cuba for Spain, and when they arrived in the Canary Islands, I was born to them. And then at the age of two, I came with my parents to Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, Cubans coming to Atlanta in 1974. My mother was in depression, having to have lived in Madrid, and all of a sudden, she's in Atlanta, Georgia in 1974. It was just a mountain at that time. But they instilled in me a love for my Lord Jesus and a love for the state and how much I love Georgia to have served it this time. And so I have to thank her too. She's in the back. My dad can't, couldn't see my election and he could not see this day, but she's here. Mom, thank you. So the light is on and I must yield, but I, thanks to the efforts of Representative Marin, you can come visit me at the fourth floor. I'm in the museum, I'm enshrined. So it's time to go. But more, I would like it more if you came by Lilburn and we can do lunch sometime. So Madam Speaker, for the last time, I yield the well. Clerk will read the caption to Senate Bill 461. Senate Bill 461. Senate Bill 461 by Senator Stone of the 23rd to be titled an act to amend Chapter 10 of Title 43 of the Fisher Code of Georgia and it's relating to barbers and cosmetologists so as to change certain provisions relating to barbering and the occupation of a cosmetologist. Bill have referred to the Committee on Regulated Industries. That committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Representative Rogers to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I have before you SB 461, and uh, this bill really has two parts to it. The first part does uh, some cleanup language. In 2015, the boards of barbers and the boards of cosmetology were combined to create one board. Since then, there has not been any cleanup language done, so basically what happened was they went, they went in, cleaned up the language, made it a little bit more applicable, and uh, made it a little bit more uh, to where everybody could understand it. The second part uh, deals with Representative Karen Mathiak's bill. It uh, was a House Bill 977, which passed regulated industries unanimously not once, but twice. Uh, the first time, it didn't make it uh, out of rules. The second time, we put it on, it went back to regulated industries, and it deals with microblading. Um, this is something that I didn't think that I'd be having a conversation about, but microblading is a tattoo, a form of tattoo that's done for cosmetic and medical purposes, unlike a regular tattoo, which has, goes through like seven or eight layers of skin. Uh, it, it only goes through two or three, and the basic gist of it is, is that it creates eyebrows for people who have lost their hair for po cosmetic purposes. It's a great thing for um, cancer patients, for burn patients, and people of this nature who are going through some tough times through chemotherapy and, and some physical trauma. Um, the bill would allow microblading to become legal. It would take and give them the opportunity to purchase insurance and would put them under the Department of Public Health, which uh, would regulate it. I don't know if I have any questions. If not, uh, I'll yield the well, but if Madam Speaker, Gentleman if I does do have, have questions. Uh, do you care to yield? Yes, ma'am, I'll uh, yield. The chair recognizes Representative Williams to your right for a question. I knew they'd cut off your mic sooner or later, Coach. <laughs> He waves. The chair recognizes Representative Cook to your right for a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Gentleman Yield. Yes, sir. 
Um, I want to draw your attention, Representative, if I could, to uh, lines 101 through 105. In that section, uh, if you could, is it not true that we're actually carving out the film and television and music industry in this bill, and they're not now going to, or they'll be, would be exempt, and Georgia citizens wouldn't? I think that is probably for the fact that they're bringing in some people uh, from out of state. Uh, it would be my, my guess, but yeah, they would be exempt under this. One further, if I could. Yes, sir. Well, if, if that's the case, then wouldn't we be concerned for those individuals that are coming in that they would be following the same thing if we're saying that that's the proper role and function of government? Uh, that's probably a good point. Um, one further, if I might. This last sure. one, I promise. Sure. Um, and 265 through 270, we're instructing the schools on what they have to teach in all the courses. Um, can, can you explain a little bit as to why we would expand the scope to everything for certain schools that might just specialize in, in certain areas of cosmetology? Uh, no, I think it's a general type of scope that uh, tries to catch everything. Uh, one of the things that there have been some concerns that have been voiced about the different boards, I think that's something that you'll be seeing us look at in the uh, off session. Thanks, sir. Chair recognizes Representative Mathiak for a question. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Is it not true that this microblading will also help um, patients with alopecia, such as a young man that we have seen pictures of him and his family is so excited that he will be able to have eyebrows. Yes, ma'am, that is a great point and I appreciate you bringing it up. I would have brought it up except for the fact that I could not pronounce <laughs> alopecia. <laughs> but thank you for that and thank you for all your hard work on this bill. Thank you, sir. Madam Chair, I think I'll yield the will at this point and ask for your favorable consideration of Senate Bill 461. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All in favor of the passage of the bill will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no. And the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of the bill. The yeas were 151, the nays were 18. The bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption to Senate Bill 427. Senate Bill 427. Senate Bill 427 by Senator Kennedy, the 18th, Stone of the 23rd, Tillery the 19th, Council to the 46th, Jones the 22nd, and others be entitled an act to amend code section 19615 in the official code of Georgia annotated relating the child support and final verdict or decree guidelines for determining the amount of award, continuation of duty to provide support, and duration of support. This bill I'm referred to the Committee on Judiciary. That committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Chairman Dempsey to speak to the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members of the House. SB 427 updates Georgia's statutory child support guidelines to bring Georgia into compliance with federal regulations on state administered child support programs. On December 20th, 2016, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families Office of Child Support Enforcement released regulatory changes applicable to all state administered child support programs. The regulation changes went into effect on January 20th, 2017. These recommended changes provide that consideration must be given to obligors 
ability to pay the ordered child support amount. Incarceration may not be treated as voluntary unemployment. The imputation of income must be based on evidence of an obligor's ability to earn and other economic factors and a child's eligibility or enrollment in public health care is to be sufficient for required health care when the support order provides for health care. If Georgia does not become compliant with these regulations, we risk losing federal funds related to the TANF block grant. Additionally, on February 2nd, 2018, Congress implemented a change to the Federal Social Security Act requiring the Division of Child Support Services to increase the annual maintenance fee charged to the obligor from $25 to $35 for each case. This House Committee substitute incorporates changes recommended by the Child Support Commission, clarifies the process of calculating child support when there is more than one child for whom support is being determined to alleviate the requirement for multiple worksheets. Making these changes ensures compliance with the final rule and avoids risking the loss of federal funds, as I said, for the TANF block grant. And will also bring the Division of Child Support Service into compliance with the recent changes made in the Federal Social Security Act. There were two amendments made in rules. I support both of these amendments, one by Representative Beskin, another by our whip, Coomer. I ask you to support this underlying bill as well as the amendments and uh, Whip Coomer will explain the amendments. I yield the well and ask for your positive vote on this measure. The lady has yielded the well. The chair recognizes Majority Whip Coomer to explain the amendments. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Two amendments. I'll talk first about AM 29-2801. AM 29-2801 is an amendment that changes one sentence of the bill so that the language tracks specifically with the federal agency guidance. And that is, uh, it says that if a parent is incarcerated, the court shall not assume an ability for earning capacity based on pre-incarceration wages or other other or other employment related income. And that is uh, on AM 29-2801. And Madam Chair, if I may, I'll go ahead and explain the additional amendment and then take questions on both. Uh, the second amendment is AM 29-2817. And this language is the language that you voted on in House Bill 654, the uh, Child Support Commission update and the House passed this measure 170 to zero when we considered it the first time. So those are the two amendments and I will be glad to answer any questions about the amendments or the bill. Uh, there is a question. The chair recognizes Representative Stovall for a question. Does the gentleman yield? Yes, of course. On uh, page two, I'm sorry, page three lines 71 through 77, more so at the bottom. I just had a question on the part where it says that the court should not uh, prevent, well, this should not prevent a court from also ordering either or both parents to obtain other health insurance for the child. Are you looking at the bill or the amendment? Yeah, I'm sorry, the bill. In 71 through 77? Yeah, so more so lines 76 through 77. So the question I had is, um, why would the court be considering additional, uh, any other health insurance if the children are receiving um, the Medicaid or the peach care? This language clarifies that the court can consider any health insurance that's available to the child in a particular case. It's not limiting the court's ability to consider one or the other. It's saying that the court cons can consider any options that are available to the child through either parent. Okay, thank you. There Is there no, no other questions? No more questions. I yield the well and ask for your favorable, favorable support. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. 
There are two amendments. The first amendment is projected on the screen. It's on your desk, AM292817. Is there any objection to adopting the amendment on the screen? Clerk will read the amendment. AM292817 by Representative Beskin of the 54th offers the following amendment. Amend the House Com Committee substitute to SB 427 LC 298057S by replacing to change on line four with the following to enact reforms recommended by the Georgia Sil Child Support Commission to clarify and revise the definition clarify the process of calculating child support when there is more than one child for whom support is being determined under certain circumstances. This amendment is printed and is on your desks. Is there objection? The chair hears none and the amendment is adopted. There is a second amendment that is being placed on the screen. It's the Coomer Amendment AM292801. The clerk will read the caption. Coomer the 14th offers the following amendment, AM292801, amend the House Committee substitute to SB 427, LC 298057S, by replacing line 41 through 43 with the following. Background factors in the case. If a parent is incarcerated, the court shall not assume an ability for earning capacity based upon pre-incarceration wages or other employment-related income, but income may be imputed based upon the actual income and assets available to such incarcerated parents. Is there objection to adopting the amendment? The chair hears none, the amendment is adopted. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute as amended? The chair hears none, the committee substitute as amended is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All in favor of the passage of the bill will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no and the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas were 171, the nays were zero. The bill having received the requisite constitutional ma majority is therefore passed. Chair has an announcement on the schedule for the day. We've been alerted that uh, Governor, Mel Governor Zell Miller's uh, body will be brought to the Capitol at 1 p.m. The chair asks that all members will line up outside on the Washington Avenue steps for the processional so that we may receive uh, Governor Zell Miller, and so that we would uh, line up at 12.45. He's expected to arrive at 1 p.m. Uh, we're going to take a break as soon as we have a few announcements here. Um, just one moment. The chair recognizes... Representative Beverly for an announcement. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the um, House Democratic Caucus will meet uh, immediately upon adjournment for recess in room 403, uh, immediately upon recess for lunch 
in uh, room 4033. Thank you. Okay. Just to clarify, so we will be breaking in a few moments. We will be back at 2.15, but the chair asks that members arrive on the Washington step side across uh, on this side of the church uh, to receive the governor's body. Chair recognizes Chairman Golick for an announcement. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would members of the Judiciary Non-Civil Committee join me here for a quick committee picture before we go outside when we go ahead and officially break? Just a quick picture at the, uh, at the break. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Cannon for an announcement. The chair will be in recess until 2.15, 2.15.